Did you know that over 63% of cyber breaches are caused by a third-party vendor? CyberGRX is on a mission to modernize third-party cyber risk management. Built on the market's first third-party cyber risk exchange, CyberGRX arms you with fast and accurate data, a proven and innovative approach, so you can make rapid, informed decisions and confidently engage with partners. Learn how partnering with CyberGRX will help you become cyber certain. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash CyberGRX. Are you struggling to reduce your cybersecurity risks and meet compliance mandates? Wishing you could be proactive instead of reactive? You need a solution that integrates cybersecurity together to make it affordable, accessible from anywhere, and simplistic, so you can gain a return on investment on your resources. Cyrisma is your answer. It gives you a single interface to identify sensitive data, vulnerable systems, insecure configurations, track progress, and assign accountability. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Cyrisma today for a seven-day test drive and impress your leadership. That's Cyrisma, C-Y-R-I-S-M-A. RSA offers business-driven security solutions that provide organizations with a unified approach to managing digital risk and designed to effectively detect and respond to advanced attacks, manage user access control, and reduce business risk, fraud, and cybercrime. For a limited time, get mobile multi-factor authentication from RSA Secure ID Access for free to help secure your remote or dynamic workforce long-term. Leverage push notification, biometric, and one-time password authenticators to secure access to your cloud applications, on-premises systems, legacy systems, privileged accounts, and more at no cost for six months. For more information, visit securityweekly.com forward slash RSA security. Welcome back to Security and Compliance Weekly. We've been talking today about the lack of diversity for African Americans in our security and compliance communities. If we want to jump back into the, that discussion, which I had a hard time finding a place to, to take a break, but uh, we'll get back to it in a minute right after a couple of announcements. First, Scythe is offering free purple t- a free Purple Team workshop where attendees get hands-on in an isolated enterprise environment for three hours. It is scheduled... It is scheduled one for December 9th, the day before Security Weekly Unlocked. I'm just reading it the way it was written for me. Uh, Register for this free workshop now, securityweekly.com forward slash purple team SW. Also, in our upcoming webcasts and technical trainings, you will learn how to build a risk-based vulnerability management program, how to prevent phishing scams, hate phishing scams, and how to move beyond vulnerability scanning to vulnerability fixing. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash webcast to see what's coming up, register, and of course, visit securityweekly.com forward slash on demand to visit our previously recorded webcasts. All right. So where we left off, Flea was asking AJ, basically, was your master's degree worth it? Take it away, AJ. Yeah, I think... uh... It was worth it because of the way I went ab- about it. Uh, but uh, most of the classes that I that I that I took, uh, I'm not using uh, in my day to day. And I don't think the other part of the question um, Flea, that you asked about if I was on the opposite end of the demographic, uh, a middle aged white dude, uh, would I have got a master's? And absolutely not. <laughs> I would not have done it. Um, I, I truly did it because I felt like I had to. Uh, but the the reason why I do think it was valuable and what I tell people uh, often that I'm mentoring now is that I didn't go to Georgetown to pass classes. I, I, I didn't care about my grades. I cared about the relationships I was building. I cared about meeting the professors. I cared about meeting my classmates, getting to know them and taking advantage of the resources that really what you're paying for. Um, all the classes are the same across these different universities. The the, unless you're going to a Harvard or some other Ivy League school, chances are you took the same classes I took at Florida State. So it's not about the education for me at these universities for a few reasons. Um, the information's sometimes outdated. Uh, it's, it, you're not gonna, going to need that information to get a job. I've never had anyone in my career ask me for my GPA. Uh, but when you go to these schools <laughs> and you're spending all this money, what you should do to get take advantage of it, and I didn't know this until I was mature enough when I went to Georgetown, is to build those relationships. Uh, so for me, it was really worth it because of the people that I met, uh, the professors that I met, the classmates that I met, and, and been able to stay in contact with. I did take a 
federal IT consulting class at Georgetown, which was run by uh, a guy that was uh, working at Deloitte. And it was it was probably one of the most eye opening courses I took because it was all uh, operational. He, he didn't teach out of a book. He, he taught us what he knew and what he was doing day to day in his job. Uh, which was really, which was really great. But um, at the end of the day, it's all about the relationships you build. I, I tell people all the time: don't focus on the your major, don't focus on the classes you're taking. Focus on the who are you meeting um, and what long term relationships are you building. And then also take advantage of all the resources the schools have: career centers, writing centers, all of those things that are out there that you're paying for. Take advantage of those and pour truly into getting involved in that community of your university, and that's where you really get to seek the value. But um, I don't think my master's helped me out in my career at all uh, to, to go back to the original question. You're raising an interesting AJ, AJ, point, a... AJ. Um, I'm sorry, Flea, I'm going to step yeah. all over you for a minute, but I, I do want to yeah. get back to you. Um, you're, you're raising an interesting point, and to tie in what Scott was saying before the break about how this whole recruiting system is based on an antiquated philosophy. I, I What I heard you just describing right now is what we used to call and maybe still call the good old boy system. You know, it's not what you know, it's who you know, which, yeah. you know, you know, realistically is the good old white boy system. And, and, and ha, ha, are, are you suggesting that there, you know, the reality is that that's, that's the system that you need to tap into and, and just morph it into something that works for, for, for a more diverse community? Uh, thoughts? Yeah, no, I think it's uh, it's not about tapping into that good old boys club. I think the reason why the good old boys club existed is because people that look like other people in the good old boys club said, hey, you come here. Um, let me help you get to where you need to go because you were in my same fraternity or whatever it may be. Uh, my mm -hmm. whole point of that uh, discussion is that I don't think uh, you're going to get your money's worth by just going to class. You're, you're, if, you're, gotcha. if you're at a university, um, and, and we can talk about whether that's the right choice or not, but if you're at a university, you're not going to get the maximum value out of that university by just going to class and getting good grades. Uh, you, in the same way we were talking about personal brand, like, and, and I think that saying of it's not what you know, it's, not, it's about who you know, it, you have to take it a step farther. It's about who knows you um, and, and yep. what do they know you for? Uh, right. Are they do they know you because you're extremely smart? They know you because you're a hard worker. Do they know you because you, you did X, Y and Z. And that matters. That goes a way longer way than whether or not you, you, you pass their final. Um, so I think it's less of uh, it, it's just networking like your, your network is so important. And it goes back to building that personal brand, which makes you resilient to any changes in the in the in the job market or the economy. When you have a strong personal brand where uh, I'll just use my name where AJ Yon is more important than what I know um, because of the people that I know and the people that I've met and they, they know who I am as a person. You know, yep. you, you can change fields, you can change careers, you can, you can make these pivots because of your personal brand of who you are. Um, not what you do, but who you are is stronger than any of those external things. So that's, that's really the whole mindset there is about going into school without thinking that there's this silver bullet of, I, I do well, I graduate college, I get a degree because that's the dream we're sold. Um, I was a first generation college kid as most, most, most black kids are. I was the first one in my college, my, my family to graduate from college. And I thought um, before I joined the military, you know, graduating college, you're going to be guaranteed a good job. I'm going to be making decent money, more money than anybody in my family ever made. And that is just going to work out. But that's not the case. It, it, it true. Your degree does not guarantee you a job. And I want people to understand that going into school, that, that, GPA is not going to matter as much as you think, but what is going to matter is your network and your personal brand of who you know. AJ. So you need to figure out a way to tap into, and it doesn't have to be the same good old boys clubs. There's plenty of black professors at these schools that are willing to give back, but too often, right. especially younger minorities, we don't talk to those people. We don't talk to the professors or to the, the CEO that graduated from our school because we feel like they're too out of touch from us. But I, I'm encouraging people to, to, to go talk to them. Um, that's what they're getting paid for. Uh, they're getting paid to as professors to sew into you as a, as a student. And you need to take advantage of that because I know I didn't at Florida State um, to the, the capability okay. that I should have. So Flea, AJ, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point Josh, out. Wait, Josh, wait. Flea was yeah, no. next. I got to say one quick thing. I'm not going to ask you a question. I'm just going to point next. out one thing. 
All right, fine, uh, Flea, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, AJ, <laughs> like, you've kind of mentioned this a couple of times, and it's kind of like in maybe some roundabout ways. Like, one, and, and this is like even bringing back towards, you know, kind of like the mission of, of Nav Crimp. Um, you mentioned mentors, and it's also like you're alluding towards it even now. We're talking about actually building those relationships of not just mentors, but also sponsors, people that can actually help open those doors where you introduce you to people, bring you into networks that maybe you didn't have access to previously. Yeah. I'm somewhat curious on a personal level, like, you know, who are some of your mentors and who are some of your sponsors? And in particular, as a you know young black man, like, how did you go about finding those mentors? How did you go about actually getting those sponsors? And are there things that you can actually tell to other, you know, underrepresented minorities about, you know, tactics that they could use to kind of expand and build their networks as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, so some of my mentors, uh, you're one of them, Flea, uh, that that has definitely helped me out in my career before we even met, um, just was, was, was following you uh, and, and everything you did, uh, because I think it's the reason why I, I already kind of knew who you were is because I always tell people, I'm like, Flea is Black, no matter what his role is. And <laughs> it's very hard sometimes to find people that have reached the level that you have uh, and still are black um, when they haven't turned that off yet. Uh, and that's that's the type of mentor or people that I look for. Uh, and I'm fortunate enough because of my, my background at Florida State where uh, it's really a family at Florida State, especially from the basketball team. So I, I text with my coaches, Coach Jones and Coach Ham all the time and their networks are ridiculous. Uh, so they're able to introduce me into uh, almost anybody I want to um, and I'm able to get there. But I, I, I tell folks all the time, like, the story that uh, I think uh, 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 Josh or Scott was telling earlier about um, uh, somebody going to a conference and sitting next to the person and asking them a question, you can now do that on LinkedIn. You can now find those people um, from the comfort of your home and, 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 and find them and reach out to them to, to get that. And I think what has to happen is you have to be willing to get rejected. You have to be willing to reach out to someone and them not respond um, and then be willing to follow up uh, and maybe follow up again. And sometimes you're just not going to get a response. But there's enough people that look like uh, Flea and myself in this industry that are willing to give back. The thing that I've learned is that, uh, especially in cybersecurity, uh, we are a very giving community. We we all, I think everybody in cybersecurity understands the potential of, of what can happen. And at least from my perspective, I understand the social and economic impacts that a career in cybersecurity can have on your family and your life. So I'm, I'm, I, I want to get people in there and I'm willing every time somebody reaches out to me to hop on a call with them at a minimum to figure out if mentorship is right or sponsorship or whatever it may be. But I think uh, my generation has to be willing to face that rejection of I'm going to one, be humble, reach out to someone and say, I need your help. I need to talk to you. I need to talk to someone in this field to learn about what do I need to do next or how do I navigate this path um, and, and be willing to send a few of those messages out, be willing to rub shoulders with, with people and, and, and do things that are out of your comfort zone to find those. The thing that uh, too often happens is people suffer in silence. Uh, they're going through trying to figure out how to get in cybersecurity or trying to, uh, as an example, veterans trying to transition out of the military into cybersecurity and they don't reach out to any veterans that have already been there. Um, so I think it's, it's about doing some of the legwork yourself to find these people. Um, and then it's also on us. It's also on me. It's also on, on you as well, Flea, for us that have made it to continue to invest time into people, um, into people that look like us and into mentorship where uh, we can't be too busy. That's one of the things that when I left my company back in March, I wanted to spend a significant amount of my weeks mentoring because I got to that point where I was too busy to mentor. And, and that's, not a, that's not a thing. Um, none of us are too busy to give back. And we it, it's two ways. The individuals that want mentorship need to be willing to reach out, but we also have to be willing to give back. We have to continuously strive. And, and sometimes it's going to take more effort, especially from us that are uh, early on trying to help close this gap, you know, there's gonna be a lot more mentees than mentors right now. So it's going to be a lot of work, but we have to be willing to put that in to find those people. Uh, and another way I find people that I want to connect with and learn from is podcasts, uh, you know, podcasts like this podcasts um, that, that I've been on as well from, from other, other shows where you can find people and hear about their stories and learn that it's not that different from your story. Um, not everybody that's got into this field uh, went to an Ivy League school or has 37 certs or um, knows quantum physics. Like 
it, a lot of us are regular people that just try really hard uh, and know how to Google. And I think that's a, a, a thing that helped me is, is being able to relate myself to others in the industry um, and, and, and get access to them. But it, it's all about, I think it's about humility when it comes to mentorship and wanting a mentor or a guide is you have to be humble to, to go out and ask that person and then be humble enough to follow up when they don't respond. Uh, that's the other part as well. Uh, so, so hey, AJ, I have a follow up on that. AJ, you, you mentioned, you know, <laughs> that you're also a mentor, and you know, the idea is like, yeah, obviously, it, it also requires time on your side. What do you look for from a mentee? Like, like you probably get far more mentees actually looking for your guidance and help, et cetera, and you still have the same 24 hours as everybody else. I'm kind of curious, like, how do you figure out? Who's going to be worth investing that additional time in? Um, when do you decide, like, hey, I, I can't respond to this person, et cetera? And in particular, when it comes to minorities and, and breaking down some of those barriers. Yeah, it's it's a pretty easy way for me to find them um, because I give whenever somebody reaches out to me and they they chat with me, I'll give them something to do. And I'll say, hey, go do this and then schedule a follow up meeting and we'll talk about it. Uh, and if if they do it, I'll, I'll follow up and talk to them. And I keep kind of. <laughs> keep asking them to do things and implement my advice because uh, time is valuable. And if I'm going to continue to spend 30 minutes or 60 minutes telling you that, hey, this is the way I think you should go about it. And then two weeks later, you want to follow up and ask me the same exact questions. I'm not going to do that. Um, so I look for a bias for action. I look for people that, uh, you know, take out and go implement some of the advice that I give, but also they go out and do something above and beyond. Um, and maybe it's if they're talking about getting into AWS and they want to talk to me about, what they should do to learn more. And I say, all right, you should look at these things, these different things, start studying or start looking at this. And then let's chat after you looked at that. Some folks will go out and schedule an exam um, and, and, and reach back out. Like I've, I've scheduled my exam. I want to chat with you about these specific concepts. And then that's where I'm like, okay, this person's actually hungry. They actually care about this and it's worth my time investing. But oftentimes it doesn't get there, unfortunately. Uh, that first call where I'm like, all right, cool. Nice to meet you. You know, we go through all of that find out what they're what they want to do, I'll give them a follow up task. And that follow up task generally doesn't happen. Uh, one of those follow up tasks, especially when people are building their personal brand or trying to get into the industry, I say stop applying for jobs, go find 10 companies on LinkedIn that you want to work with, find 10 <laughs> people at each of those companies that are in positions that you're interested in, or have a cert that you're interested in, or whatever it may be, add them on LinkedIn, and then send them a message thanking them for connecting and do that. So that's 100 people that you need to go find and add. And then let's chat. And the people that have done that, the next conversation has been, oh, I've talked with X amount of people at these companies because they, they, they responded to my message and we had a good conversation. And then there's people that I never hear from again because they probably just didn't want to put that work in. So um, I, I found out early on, Flea, I think actually we had a conversation about this probably um, earlier on in the year around mentorship versus sponsorship. And I realized that I had to figure out a way to weed out the people that were really wanted a mentor because they were going to put the work in to get into this field versus the people that just wanted to talk to someone about the problems they were facing or about how hard the job. No, 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 the no. Job You're missing is. something there. The other part of the, of those people is the people that are at, expecting you to do the work for them. Oh, here's 15 <laughs> jobs. And, <Yeah. laughs> and you know, you're right. Time is the one asset you have that you cannot get back. You can make money, you can lose money, but you can't get your time back. And there's yeah. a lot of people that are absolutely worthy of your time. And there's some that are not. And you giving them a task like that, you know what? You've given them the way to learn how to set, set the rest of their life in motion. If you yeah. told them, okay, go look for a job and I'll help you get it. Uh, to a certain extent, that's one thing. But here's a technique you can use to set up to get 20 jobs is, yeah. you know, teach a man to fish, man. So exactly. well done and well said. You know, as, and as a mentor. Fish as is in P-H-I-S-H, Josh. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> How you get your money is different. It's not my business. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as a, as a mentor, um, you know, I, I've had a, I've had a couple of people that have come to me and said, hey, you know, I want you to I want you to teach me all things cyber. And I've always said, you know, I'm not going to teach you. I am not going to position you, but I'm going to enable you to learn. Right. You have to yep. show me that you want it versus me handing it to you, because, you know, going back to the first discussion about drive and dedication. Right. It, it, the same remains true here. You have to show that you want it before you can get it, right? 
we've all paid our dues exactly. being in this industry, whether it's starting in help desk, starting in a network analyst position or security analyst position, you have to show us that you want it. You have to show us that you're going to be a value back to the community just as much as we are a value to you. Yep. Yeah. You know? No, absolutely. So, it's about that effort. It's, 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 it, I think most things in life come down to effort, um, come down to what you're, the, the work that you're willing to put in. Um, we can find, you can find any information to do anything on the internet. It's a matter of if you want to actually do it. So yeah, um, I think that's the, the part about mentorship that hopefully as, as more of, of folks uh, that, that are able to get into mentorship to help solve this problem is that their mentorship is focused on teaching people like not, not teaching them how to do things, but giving them, like you said, enabling. I like, I like the way you phrase that um, similar to what we should be doing as security professionals. Anyways, we should be enabling the business, but we should enable people to either get into the field, grow their brands, but then that builds better future cybersecurity professionals versus, Hey, you, I know X at this company, I'm going to make the intro. And now you have a job um, instead of, you know, going through those steps to, to get in. You know, we've been having a, yeah. a very, a very interesting discussion on Discord about the difference between uh, degrees and certifications, and then mentorship, and like the longstanding, the longstanding rule of thumb that 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 we go by uh, in the security community is that the degree will get you the job, but the cert gets you the money, right? <laughs> so, how would you how would you take that to somebody who's brand new in in the industry and say, okay, you need. Uh, oh, gee, I don't know, network plus, A plus, security plus to start, right? And then once you have all three of those, then we can start talking about you getting into an InfoSec role. Or is it the the matter of build me a home lab, show me that you've documented everything, tell me how you walked through figuring out the networking problems and the hardware problems and this, that, and the other. Which route do you like to take? Yeah, I think uh, I like a hybrid of the home lab versus certs. Then you're in the field where you don't necessarily, I don't need you as you're learning what subnetting is to try to establish your home router because you're going to do it wrong. And then I also don't need you teaching me how to subnet um, with a blog when you just learned how to subnet. Um, I think that's the problem that mo a lot of people jump into is they start teaching before they've learned the concept. Uh, but what you should be doing, and, and oftentimes what happens is people get certs, but they don't tell anybody about the cert until they, they got the cert. And the only thing they do is post, hey, look at me. I have a network plus now. Also, I'm looking for a job, uh, <laughs> which to most people, that just means you passed the test. It, it doesn't <laughs> prove that you know anything. Um, but if you did learn something, you could do what I like to call these, these value validation projects, where you go out and say, I learned X. And here's what I did with this information. Uh, and, and here's why it matters. Um, and you can do that in the form of a LinkedIn post, an article, a blog, a video, whatever it may be. You can show that you took information from the cert that relates to the real world and, and, and explain why it matters. And I, and I think that's the part where people um, can get over that experience hump. Um, you know, a lot of times people are like, well, Every job says I need three years of experience, but I need the job to get experience. So how am I supposed to do that? Well, prove to people that you know what you're talking about. Um, record a video of you doing something. If you if you want to be a SOC analyst, go out and get a free trial of one of these tools out here. Uh, set it up in your cloud environment and do some things and, and show people. Um, or if you just learned a concept on Security Plus, let's prove that you know what you're talking about beyond just the cert. Um, I think LinkedIn's a great place to do that because people just don't post on LinkedIn as often as the, the 600 million people that are on LinkedIn. I think only like two or 3% of them uh, actually are posting actively. So it's a great place for you to stand out and show that, okay, I have net plus, but here's what it means. Here's what I've learned. Here's the 10 things that I've learned. And, and all those posts and the, thing I, the reason why I keep harping on LinkedIn is because LinkedIn can serve as a live repository of what you know. Versus your resume is a static copy of what you've done. It just shows you have net plus, you have sec plus, you have these jobs, and here's your name. Um, but so, LinkedIn so can let show me break in okay, here. he has let me net break plus, in here. but here's what can, they know. 
Here's all the things that they know. He has set plus. Here's also what they know because they shared it with us. Um, here's the things that they've created or the, or the events that they went to and, and talked about some of the concepts that they learned from security plus and applied it to this AWS reinvent that's going on today and brought it together and talked about it where people can actually show, Hey, I can add value. Um, here's how I can add value and because because of what I've learned in this cert. And I think more people need to do that where they're talking about the things that they've learned, um, explaining the things that they're learned that they learned, um, not to teach me how to do it, but to show that you know what you're doing. You show that you know how to go set something up. You know how to run a vulnerability scan and assess the results, whatever it may be. Um, but I think that's where people, that's that bias for action. Uh, instead of just getting your cert and telling the world, hey, I got a cert, look at me. I got this cert. Here's the study materials I've used. Here's what's helped me. And in the next 10 days, I'm going to tell you about the 10 concepts that I learned that I think are going to apply to my future role. Uh, and then you so just go off and do that. Is is saying is saying the 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 your resume, is that like saying that's a pen test, whereas going on LinkedIn is continuous monitoring? So point oh, I'm, gonna hurt you. I'm gonna hurt you so bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Wow. No, really, just... really though, it's 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 if it's you tough. are if you are a longtime listener of the show, right, and you've been with us through the last 54 episodes of of wow, right? And you want to learn more about compliance, you want to learn more about security, uh, getting involved in the Discord and starting to talk with the hosts and talk with the other people that are there uh might be a really good resource, right, AJ? Yeah, absolutely. You should you should force us that are um, out here speaking publicly, force us to to meet you and talk with you. But we're not going to we're not going to just meet and talk with everybody. So, like, you have to get involved in these communities. I tell folks all the time when they're trying to get into a field, find the podcast in that field and listen to every episode and then go reach out to the host, um, post about their episode, uh, comment on their stuff on LinkedIn. In the same way that person sat next to that individual at the conference, you can do that on LinkedIn. You can, you can literally sit next to whoever and by commenting on their posts every time they post or posting about their episodes. So yeah, you should, you should get deeply entrenched into these communities to, uh, to succeed and build that network. It's, it's, it's definitely necessary. So would you also agree with the statement of don't push yourself to be the smartest person in the room, push yourself to be the most transparent and dedicated person in the room? Um, I never really liked that sent that statement of don't be the smartest person in the room. Um, not because I think I'm ever the smartest person in the room, but it's just, I don't know if it's sports or what, but, um, you should want to be the smartest person in the room. Like I, I never go into a room and saying like, like I want to be the dumbest person here. Um, I, I do want to know a few things and I want to continue to, to, to learn those things. And if I learn more than other people, I'll give it back to them. But I think you should come off as hungry, uh, coming off as somebody that really wants and is interested in this field goes a long way um, because there's so many people that are tangibly interested in cybersecurity or they think they're interested in it. But as soon as they uh, try to solve their first problem and uh, their their eyes get cross-eyed because they've been looking at the screen for, for four hours and they have no clue uh, what they're what they're reading um, and they quit. But we can see it as all cybersecurity professionals. Like I imagine y'all, you on this, on the podcast here, you guys, you, you can see it when somebody's actually interested, when somebody's actually interested in the field and, and wants to learn is, and is excited about it. And that fires me up. That makes me want to help you even more when I see that you actually care about this stuff um, at the level that I care about it. Some of us older folks might even think that about you, AJ. <laughs> no, that's only when you have a walker, Jeff. Oh, God. Yeah, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> wow. Uh, we've covered so much ground and you've dropped so much uh, truth on us, AJ, that uh, what I find interesting is that truth is truth. It, it, it transcends gender, race, socioeconomic disposition, whatever. Uh, and you've given, uh, I can't even keep up with the questions and comments that have come in on the discord server. Uh, hopefully you can jump on the discord server and, and stay with us for a little bit as we transition to the after party. Uh, but I want to give, uh, you an opportunity before we, we end the, uh, episode today to, you know, just give us any, <laughs> like you haven't already give us any kind of parting words of wisdom. 
Yeah, I think the uh, especially the the topic of this episode, one of the things that I, I definitely wanted to mention is the news cycle has died down with respect to the social and uh, social injustices, systematic systemic racism, everything that's going on in this country that has been going on since the inception of this country. Uh, the news cycle has, has slowly went away from it um, with everything that's that's still going on um, in 2020. However, the black people that everyone was concerned about that uh, the news was talking about that all of my white friends that called me back in March and said, oh, man, I didn't know this was happening. This is crazy. I'm still black in December. Uh, (laughs) I I, I still feel the same way. Um, So despite (laughs) the news turning it off, we're still black. These problems still exist and we're still actively trying to solve them. Uh, So, Mm -hmm. you know, check in on your black friends, check in on on folks and, and, and really look at yourself and say, what am I doing that I was talking about doing back in March or April? What am I doing now that reflects that? Am I still feeling that same excitement or was it just because everybody was doing blackout posts on their LinkedIn or, or, or black in, or the corporate, all these corporate organizations were making all these statements. Um, what's actually happening now that the news cycle is out because we're still black and these issues still persist. And uh, that's why I was really glad that we were we were talking about this today, because I think it's important that these conversations still happen where people are aware that these problems didn't go away just because the news cycle died down um, and they're not going to go away overnight. They're going to still happen. They've been happening in this country for for years. Um, and I mean, I, I served in the army. I love America. Um, and I think it's the it's, it's, it's one of the greatest places in the world to live. Uh, but we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and, and to do that work, we have to be aware of the problems and we can't ignore them just because the news cycle died down. Uh, so my parting message is I'm still black as I was back in March. Um, and the problems that exist still exist. So we need to continue to, uh, find solutions to these problems. But I uh, I guess, lastly, definitely appreciate you all having me on, um, it's, it's a pleasure to talk with folks that care about security and compliance. Uh, there's not a lot of us out there, but hopefully we can continue to change that. Uh, I'll definitely We're, hop into the Discord uh, for, for the next 40 minutes or so before I have to uh, hop onto a call. But um, this, is, this has been a lot of fun. We'd we'll love to come on again in the future. Excellent, AJ. Thank you. I, I do want to ask you one question, and, and Flea, you can certainly weigh in too because you qualify because you look like AJ. Um, you know, you brought up the, the, the news cycle and, you know, the whole, you know, I, I think it was partially because the country was shut down and we didn't have anything else to do, so everybody decided to rally around the causes. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but m- my question to you is, uh, as a can't be any more privileged middle-aged white male in this country and and i'm unapologetic it's not my fault i was born white um how do, what is advice what what do you tell us white people that want to help uh and help and help make a difference and are uh interested and curious and and compassionate uh you know, when when everything was getting, you know, all the marches and all the sit-ins and, it and protests were happening uh, over the summer, uh, I, I was a little despondent in one sense that, you know, gosh, I wish I wish the movement could make a difference, you know, just because black people have been screaming that there's a problem for centuries and it didn't take all the white people uh, getting involved for, you know, something to actually happen. And I, and I asked a couple of my friends about it and they're like, well, and I think I heard news reports where people said, you know, people, people that look like you said something to the effect of, well, you know, that's how the civil rights movement, you know, got hold in the fifties and sixties was, you know, more people got involved and it's sort of necessary necessary to get everybody involved and that necessarily means white folks but it still makes me feel kind of funny that nothing really takes hold until the white people get involved you know when it's when it's something like this um whether you have an opinion on that and and want to call me out that's fine but uh, you know in terms of a parting parting thought uh you know what do you people that look like you uh, want us people that look like me to do to help you? What is appropriate? Uh, you know, help help us to help you. Yeah, Flea, you want to go first? 
Uh, sure, I, I can go first. And, and I think the great thing about actually going first, in particular since we have AJ and myself on, is one, like, yep, AJ and I, we do look, look alike, but we're actually not the same. And when yeah. you think about <laughs> underrepresented minority groups, we also always have to recognize that none of these groups are monolith. So, like, you know, yep, mm-hmm. Jeff, you are white, um, you're from Maryland, but you're not the same as the white people I grew up with in Mississippi. Uh, I probably have a lot more in common with a white redneck in Mississippi than I do with you, Jeff, just because of culture and, and how we actually grow up. I remember you and I actually talked mm-hmm. about things like Thanksgiving dinner and, you know, the differences between people in the South versus the North. Um, mm-hmm. I mentioned that only because it's useful for people that want to help to actually listen to the people that they're asking to help. Um, and mm-hmm. really just reaching out and saying, hey, you know, black person, whatever. Uh, what is it you would like from me? How can I best help you? And then the second aspect of that is also being comfortable being uncomfortable. Like these are conversations and things like that, that, you know, we don't talk about a lot in America and probably not nearly as much as we should. And that means we're going to step in it. You're going to say something, Jeff, that may be offensive to me. And it may even be something you even realize. I might say something to you that's going to be offensive to you and you may not even realize it. So we also, on both sides and all sides, we also always have to have our hearts open for forgiveness as well, um, but also have our hearts open for the courage that it takes to actually reach out across the aisle, actually talk to somebody different. Um, and then probably actually the final thing is is make your platforms available. Uh, you know, like you have access and things like that. We all, you know, we were talking about like, you know, good old boys network, et cetera. And like, so for example, me as a black person, but I'm, I'm still a male and, you know, I still have, you know, male privilege in society. And that means I need to be conscious about making sure that I'm also using that platform to enable, you know, women and, and other minorities that actually want to get involved in the industry to give them access, et cetera. So I, I wish I could give you just a pithy one word answer, but it's a complex problem, <laughs> which requires, you know, several different tactics, complex solutions and a lot of nuance. Yep. And I, uh, I echo all of that. I would say uh, the two things, uh, like Flea said, like we're not all the same. So I think the world or America is diverse enough to where most white people know a black person or several black people. So go talk to them. Um, talk to the black people that you know and ask them, uh, you know, how are they feeling uh, about things that are going on or what experiences have they had? I think that's the conversation that I had at the start of this where a lot of my white friends didn't know that I experienced police brutality, that I get PTSD when I see this stuff on the news because it reminds me of me being slammed on the floor as a, as a 12, 13 year old. Uh, so talk to them and find out their stories. We all have stories. Um, we all have some form of a story of something that happened to us. And I think normalizing those conversations where you understand, despite what AJ looks like, despite that he was in the army, X, Y, and Z, he still experienced some of the same stuff I'm seeing on TV. So I'm not as far away from it as I may feel. I'm not as safe as I may feel because that same person that's on the news where everybody's wearing the RIP shirts of that person, that could be your friend. That could be your black friend. And I think when people make it more personal, uh, changes start to happen. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, you know, white people have to police white people. <laughs> um, I don't know, this might not be a, uh, a, a popular point, but, uh, you know, there's racist white people out there, there's racist black people, and they're not all around black people. They may be saying racist things in front of you or doing things in front of you that are not okay and you know they're not okay and and we have to have more self-policing across this country where there's some more responsibility of hey i'm a white guy you're a white guy you shouldn't have said that that's racist and 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 needs to be called out by people that look like them as well um so that they have that reckoning that look in the mirror of okay i'm wrong here um so you know i think it's it's talk to the it's, it's 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 about individuals' personal networks. Um, it really is what I'm getting at. Talk to the black people in your own personal network. Talk to the white people in your own personal network about what's going on. And I get it. You know, we have generations of this going on, so some people just aren't going to change. But you have to be willing, like Flea said, to be uncomfortable, to be able to tell your aunt that she's racist um, if she's doing something racist, and be able to call them out. And I, and I think that's the important part to help us continue to move the needle forward. Hmm. Scott, you want to check us out? Uh, Flea and AJ, thank you for joining us. Um, I guess is, do you, do you want me just to roll it and just go? <laughs> roll it and just um, go. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, I guess to everybody that is listening and everybody that's watching, thank you for joining us. Johnny, you want to hit that music? 
and of course Johnny's like going crap and reaching across the board uh, for Jeff, Josh, and myself. Uh, thank you for joining us in another episode of Security and Compliance Weekly, where we are continuing to build bridges and break down silos. Join us next week.